Oh hey, what's going on, Elasmites? Welcome back to the show that butters your biscuit. I, your host, Sam McNeely, will personally be buttering your biscuits today with an episode that honestly went in directions that I was not prepared for. At first, I was like, oh no, we're getting off track. But I just went with it, and I learned so much more than I expected to. But before I introduce this week's guest and what we talked about, let's have a quick talk. Just you and me, one-on-one. I want to thank you first for listening today, whether this is your first time or if you're a seasoned elasmite. I also want to give a huge thank you to all you Patreon donors who keep this show going by giving at patreon.com slash elasmospod. If you're thinking about supporting this podcast, please check out that Patreon page to see what additional benefits you can receive by becoming an Elasmite donor. So that's patreon.com slash elasmospod. Thanks, shark friends. Thanks also to those who rate and review this podcast. And remember, if you rate and review this podcast on whatever platform you're listening to it on and send that rating and review to me at elasmospod at gmail.com, you'll be entered into a raffle to win a prize from our guests from episode one. If you share this podcast on social media, you'll get two extra entries into that drawing. So rate, review, share on social media, and email me at elasmospod at gmail.com. You can find the Elasmos Podcast on Instagram and Twitter at elasmospod, and our Facebook page and YouTube channel are both called the Elasmos Podcast, a Sharks Universe, and our website is elasmospod.com where you can find links to all these media outlets. And lastly, don't forget to send your listeners' adventure stories to me at elasmospod at gmail.com for our listeners' episodes and to encourage ecotourism. Okay, now, let's do this thing. Our guest this week is a unique guest and kind of a bit of a star. So that's an understatement. He received his bachelor's degree in business from Indiana University, and he's hosted multiple hours of TV on National Geographic and the History Channel. He was also the host of the four-time Emmy Award-winning Offshore Adventures. He's also been the recipient of many awards and recognitions for his work in disrupting traditional systemic practices. And last but definitely not least, he is the founding chairman and expedition leader for OSEARCH. OSEARCH is a global nonprofit that uses collaboration to accelerate our scientific understanding of marine giants. What marine giants, you ask? Great white sharks. That's right. We talked about so many different topics from volunteering with Meals on Wheels to the flaws within the current scientific system, the truth about happiness, tracking great white sharks, how to make math and education fun, OSEARCH's impact on policy, and tons more. So fasten your seatbelts and prepare your notepad for OSEARCH's founder, Chris Fisher. This is Episode 9. Hey, Chris, thanks so much for joining me. I really appreciate you doing this with me today. No problem, man. No problem. Happy to be here. Great. Well, I'm excited for this, and I know my listeners are too, because you're super well-known, and OSEARCH is such a leader in the great white community, so it's really cool. I'm really glad to chat with you. And so, before we get all into OSEARCH, I kind of want to learn more about your background prior to that. So, like, where are you from, and what was your background like before OSEARCH? Well, I was, um, I grew up in Louisville, Kentucky. So, I grew up chasing fish and frogs around the woods of Kentucky and the farm ponds and the creek and really fell in love with water there. Um, I had a very entrepreneurial father, serial entrepreneur. So, we had always those kind of conversations at the dinner table. You know, nothing's impossible if you're creative enough to find a way to solve any puzzle, it's solvable. And then on the weekends, my mom, you know, we delivered meals on wheels with her. So I think we learned that, you know, really a lot of the best feelings you have, a lot of the joy in life comes from serving. Meals on Wheels is a wonderful nonprofit organization in the U.S. And its purpose is to feed and provide support for senior citizens all across the country. This is done by businesses making little meal kits for people to deliver to seniors and provide 
oftentimes the only community interaction that these senior citizens are going to have for the day. So it not only contributes to their social well-being, but it also gives them food at a reduced price, which is really important because a lot of seniors are living below the poverty line. And Meals on Wheels has always had a special place in my heart. When I was little, my mom, my nana, and I would go around in our car, and we'd run a route delivering meals to senior citizens just in our county. And it was a great way to interact with other people throughout our community, but it was also a really great bonding experience for my mom, my nana, and I. My nana passed away in September of 2021 due to COVID, and those are some of the fondest memories I have, is going around with her and my mom, delivering meals across the county. We had such a good time, and it was just such a good bonding experience for all of us. And a few years later, my mom actually ended up working for our local Meals on Wheels and being a director and coordinator for all the different delivery routes and making sure people got what they needed when they needed it. So it's been a really big, influential part of our family as well. So I can definitely relate to Chris's relationship with Meals on Wheels and just the act of serving and helping others, because this is something that I grew up around. And I really encourage that other people go do this too, because Meals on Wheels is just a really simple and fun way to get to interact with people and to help people in a much needed situation. And there are a couple ways that you can help out. You can simply donate or you can volunteer and deliver meals yourself to people in your community. And the best way to do this is to just Google search Meals on Wheels and then the name of your city. Or you can go to MealsOnWheelsAmerica.org and learn more about how to sign up and just be an extra helping hand for those who really need it. Sorry this is long, but this is something that's meant a lot to me and obviously to Chris too. And I think we have a lot to offer as a community in helping each other. So I think this is a fantastic way and you should go look into it because it's really easy and doesn't take more than an hour or two out of your time just to give these people an essential service that they need. So go learn more at MealsOnWheelsAmerica.org. So really grew up with this kind of entrepreneurial spirit and this uh, joy of serving. Uh, And went to college at uh, Indiana University's Business School and the National University of Singapore, studying international business focused on uh, Asia and the Pacific Rim. And then uh, participated in a family business, my brothers and father and I had started when I was really young and they were older than me. They really started it. I was just always helping out and came out of school and worked for them for a number of years. And when I was 29 years old, they decided to sell the business. And so I needed to get another job. And I had all throughout that had a passion for the water and had been out fishing. And I was living in California at the time, spending a lot of time on the water and really like taking a little time to reflect on what was I going to do. You know, I really was spending that time on the water and was coming back to the beach and talking to people about what I saw. And I really didn't have much engagement. People, you know, back in the nineties, they weren't thinking about the ocean the way they do now. Mm -hmm. And um, I couldn't really get any traction on what, you know, good things we were seeing and bad things we're seeing just in my social circles. And uh, I was like, why is that? Why are people? And then, you know, I thought back to my childhood, you know, and Cousteau was my hero, right? Right. Jacques Cousteau. But a lot of people under the age of 40 don't even know who Cousteau was. So I just realized that I haven't explained who Jacques Cousteau is before. And I think that's weird because when I first heard of Jacques Cousteau, I just thought he was like a French spy, kind of like the Pink Panther. I don't know why. I don't know where that comes from. My mind's a mess. But Jacques Cousteau was a French naval officer, an explorer, a conservationist, a filmmaker, a scientist, a photographer, an author, and a researcher, and he studied the sea and all forms of life underwater. He has incredible documentaries that have won multiple awards, and he's got some great books out there too. And he's known for also co-creating some of the first scuba diving equipment called the Aqualung. So Jacques Cousteau was, I guess, one of the first science communicators for the ocean and for marine life. And he brought that to documentaries. So when he was creating these around the 1950s, they were pretty unique and pretty much the first of their kind. So Jacques Cousteau is known for being one of the first to bring the ocean and its inhabitants to people sitting on their couch. Which is amazing because not a lot of people get to see all the incredible things that are in the ocean. So Jacques Cousteau has been the inspiration for many marine scientists. So after thoroughly examining his Wikipedia page, 
Cousteau is not a French spy. He's just a cool marine jack-of-all-trades. You know, the ones that are really into the ocean, they may know, but I'm talking about like general knowledge. Whereas when I was growing up, everyone knew. Mm. And he had passed away and there had been no one really pouring the world's oceans into people's lives at radical scale. And I felt like if we were going to make an impact on the future of the ocean, we needed to get back to that in some way where someone or some group of individuals or organizations was pouring the world's oceans into people's lives at radical scale, you know, billions of impressions a year. And so I was young enough and dumb enough at 29 that that was the noble goal. I said, I'm going to pour the world's oceans into people's lives at a scale and scene <laughs> since Cousteau. And I started benchmarking his life, how many expeditions that he led. He led 22, various other aspects of his reach to just kind of try to create a target to shoot at. For me, it was uh, fishing was the obvious place to start because that's where my passion was and was doing a lot of that at the time. So started a production company called Fisher Productions and started trying to make a pilot for this show, which turned out to become Offshore Adventures, which was the show that was on ESPN Outdoors about fishing and free diving, you know, in the 90s and early 2000s, kind of pre-internet. It was back when fishing and hunting was only on Saturday morning on ESPN Outdoors. So when I did that, started to really get into the actual fishing industry, right? And some of the mm-hmm. companies, because uh, the companies were funding our work and we were engaged with them and then began to learn about organizations like the Billfish Foundation and other nonprofits in that recreational fishing space and joined the board of the Billfish Foundation and uh, started to see there was a big disconnect, like the scientists were trying to get out tags, but they had no boats, no money, and didn't know how to catch what they studied. Oh, my God. You know, it kind of makes it difficult when you don't have the knowledge or the abilities to do something you're trying to do. Not impossible, but really, really difficult. Data collection was a major problem. They were stuck, right? It's all about the data in the end. Mm. And so... While I was making the show, I realized it wouldn't cost me any more money to bring a scientist along. I had the boat paid mm. for. We were doing that. We were, you know, we had a nice business going. It was paying for the boat. So I started to bring scientists I knew who needed help catching things so they could collect the data for their papers to publish, which hopefully would be leveraged for policy in the end. Mm, and yeah. uh, really began to accelerate the rate at which that group could collect data, right? If they've been trying to get six tags out for two years and we're releasing 50 a year, we, we can radically accelerate the rate of data collection. And at the time, a lot of the people in the science space were explaining to, to me that the biggest challenge in creating an abundant future for the ocean is data deficit and time. Mm. We don't have the data sets we need and we're running mm-hmm. out of time. So I really got into like, man, I was working on the water. I was doing good for the scientists. I was accelerating the rate of data collection. And that Mm -hmm. was all we did because we thought that, you know, after that, the science would publish and then it would be leveraged for policy. We just assumed all the help that was needed was in, you know, catching things and letting them go alive. We were good at that. And then the scientists started talking to me about sharks around 2005, 2006. They're like, man, our shark populations are getting crushed. And they started to be like, man, if we don't get the shark thing right, we can't deliver an abundant future to the ocean. Like if there's no sharks, there is no abundant future. They are the wolf. They are the lion, right? They are the balance keeper. Yeah. And we were down to these crazy low numbers, right? Which you know all about 9% of all large sharks are all the only ones remaining and things like that were what you were reading at the time, losing a hundred million sharks a year, primarily Mm -hmm. for fitting and also for consumption. And so I was like, oh, wow, I didn't know the shark crisis existed. I was like, well, certainly somebody's working on that. You guys are saying no big sharks, you know, no abundant future. So it's got to be some focus and some capacity on this. And it turned out, you know, it was like, no, not really. I mean, they're so big. The only thing we can do is kind of harpoon things into these sharks, these very primitive methods. We don't really have the access to the animal to solve their full life history puzzle. Many of you might know what life history means, but for me, I didn't learn until this past fall. So in case you don't remember, I'm just a dummy out here trying to learn more and make myself more smarter. Okay, so life history is essentially just the story of an organism's life cycle. So different characteristics of an organism's life history could be how long they live, 
How often they reproduce? At what age do they mature and are able to reproduce? How long or tall do they get? How many babies do they have when they reproduce? And I could literally keep going on forever, but that gives you an idea that life history is just essentially telling the story of how an animal lives its life which is essential for us to know for conservation purposes because we need to know how these things live and how they operate so that we can try to preserve their lives and the biodiversity of our planet. So in a few short sentences, there's life history. End scene. You know, from when their life story, from when they're born until they die. So we, if we have that data set, then we could help them recover. Right. We can look after the birthing areas. We can look after the nursery. We can give them room in the mating areas. We know what countries need to participate in the conversation because they have massive movements. And I was like, oh, wow, you just said no big sharks, no abundant future. And now you're telling me we don't have the data. Nobody's really attacking this data set with like real capacity in a more clinical, modern, cooperative, collaborative approach. Like, yeah, and I said, well, I guess we better do that. The ocean had been very good to us. We'd had a wonderful time for a, long, uh, a number of years. And it felt like, you know, we Captain Brett and I had started having kids, started mm-hmm. thinking about the future of the ocean, started, you know, wondering, are we contributing enough to that? You know, we've had so many wonderful times on the water. And we pivoted in 2007 to build an enterprise to help these scientists around the world who study these larger apex predators solve the life history puzzle of those animals so we can manage them back from the brink. And if we manage our large shark populations back successfully, the ocean will move back toward balance and abundance. And so Mm -hmm. really, you know, I didn't really choose sharks. I feel like, I feel like sharks chose us. Hmm. We're more like all ocean people, abundance, you know, those of us that are on the ship and come from the beginnings of O-Search. We just Mm -hmm. learned that, look, you can't affect the future of the ocean on a fisherman's story. You need a peer-reviewed published paper, and then you need someone to pick that up and leverage it for policy if it needs to be done uh, based on whatever that data says. The traditional system of academia and things that were going on were so inefficient, and all all the scientists were siloed because they're fighting the publisher parish game and grant wars. And so they're not collaborating. So what I really began to realize is that everyone was complaining about data deficit and time is the major problem in the ocean. I began to realize that that problem has been created by the system that's actually supposed to be answering those questions. Wow. If the system itself is so inefficient, it forces all these people into silos. They're all good people. Mm-hmm. It's a bad system. Right. And they got to beat each other to get the next grant. And that's totally inefficient, right? So, you know, just for example, we do 24 research projects on every shark we touch. Oh, my gosh. That would have been 24 different scientists trying to catch their own shark to get one piece of that data. Wow. Well, I had real problems with that. Like, number one, okay, that's totally inefficient. And we're all talking about data deficit and time problems. Number two, I'm like, that's not shark first. Yeah. you got to catch 24 times more sharks than we do to get the data set to manage them back. And that's not shark first. That's not ocean first. Shark Mm -hmm. first is like honor the beast. If we're going to capture this thing, we have an obligation to learn everything we need to learn from it to create a future for itself and the others like it. Right. Otherwise that's not like honoring the beast or respecting the, you know, the, you know, the animal. Mm -hmm. So that changed. Then then all of a sudden it it got really bumpy and there's still some issues. You know, we became very disruptive in the traditional science world Mm -hmm. because we would come into an area, we would invite the local senior person to be the chief scientist, but then we would be like, wait a minute, you're a bio telemetry person. So We need to bring in the vets for all the reproductive work. We need to bring in the microbio people. We need to bring in ultrasound. (laughs) We need to bring in the blood people, the hormone people, the toxicology people, you know, and all this stuff. And they're like, well, wait a minute, you can't do that. I'm trying to get ahead of those people. You know, we're paying for it. We give the ship to the scientists for free. It's our crew that has perfected and developed the method to capture these things and give them 15 minutes with them safely before we then let them go. I just said, look, everyone is welcome here. That's our, awesome. great, our, our great that's grandkids got no more time for the siloed approach. And so that's really the story, I think, of, of at least the science side of things, of how 
of mm-hmm. Blue Search kind of came about. And uh, I really try to be an enabler, trying to bring like the world-class practical together, professional watermen and know how to operate a ship around the world and catch things and let them go alive. Bring that practical expertise together with a large collaborative multidiscipline science team and then open source it all around the capacity we bring with the ship. And so that's allowed us to kind of force people to collaborate, for lack of a better term, which now (laughs) once people start doing that, they love it. And then they get more science done. They get more grants. The fear of this individual approach is entrenched in everyone because that's how they kind of came up through the system. But the Mm -hmm. reality is when you let go of that and you collaborate, you get more done. People like to fund collaborators more. You know, and so our, I would say our science team, which is now 34 scientists from 24 research institutions doing 24 different research projects on every animal we touch. That's so impressive. They're telling me because we provide the ship for free that they leverage that to get grants for their science and for the, the money they need for themselves. They're closing a lot more grants because they can say, oh, by the way, I've got $2 $2 million worth of free ship time to complete this project. I just need $80,000 for equipment, machinery, and salary. And then those donors know like, oh my God, this is like me giving you 2 million, 80,000, but you got the 2 million covered, right? So yeah. we're seeing our scientists really, really enjoy tremendous success getting their grants approved because we give the ship to them. They end up getting more, but I think the traditional fear is that they'll Somehow it'll be negatively impacted in the grant game if you come out of that individual approach. And just, but we're just not seeing that. That's so encouraging to hear because I'm just coming from my undergraduate studies at the University of North Carolina at Wilmington. And thinking about the research that I've done and the professors that I've worked with over the years, I saw how competitive and heard how competitive those grants are for each individual. And it seems like such a weird concept because, yes, they are trying to get money to be able to fund their research, fund their salary, and fund the equipment they need for their research. But it seems so backwards that it's so competitive and it's so cutthroat because that competitiveness within this field makes it seem so self-centered. But the overall goal that we're all trying to achieve is an abundant world, is abundant life, and understanding this life as best we can. But competing like this, it it just doesn't make sense. It makes it, it's such a paradox that we're competing against each other to get more money and more credibility to somehow help each other. I mean, it just doesn't work like that. And it doesn't make sense. Like in, in the current system, if you were going to save the world, you'd have to save it yourself. Well, that's not going to happen. It's going to take us all, right? So yeah, no, it's just an antiquated system that needs to be disrupted. And, and we're disrupting that, right? I mm-hmm. mean, here we are. O-Search starts in 2007. You know, think about as someone who's starting off in the science space and, and is trying to publish some papers. You know, how many papers might they publish in 13 years? You know, maybe a couple? Yeah. Right. Very few. We've published 55 peer reviewed papers and have another 40 getting ready to pop in that same period of time. Oh, my God. You can see the efficiency, right, of bringing people together, accelerating the rate of data collection, holding people accountable when you give them ship time and help them get their data set so that they complete Mm -hmm. their projects. And now we're seeing even that there's some sort of there's, you know, it's not very efficient when it leaps from a published paper into the policy space. So we're talking Mm. about now starting the O-Search Ocean Policy Institute at Jacksonville University so that we make Mm. sure, number one, that we're a booming voice from the middle, data-driven, practical, solution-oriented people based on science, not fringy emotional dispositions that polarize and paralyze and are position-oriented, right? The answer is going to be based on science down the middle. It's Uh going to affect everybody. we got to figure out a way for everybody through. And to be that big booming voice in the center and, and really just show that there's another way that can get every, actually everyone working together for the abundant future, rather than competing with each other uh, along the way, which kind of now we're launching with a rocket from a data collection and learning standpoint. So it's been yeah. great to prove that model. I mean, one of the things I'm trying to work on now, we've done 40 expeditions since 2007. What? Oh my gosh, that's awesome. Congrats on that huge milestone. 
Yeah, and 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 it's just been great. Now I hope that we're we can get it more contagious across the world. Like, look at how this model works. Look at how much more efficient it is. We we can get the data we need before it's too late, but we can't keep doing things the way we've been doing them. That's what's created the data deficit problem. It's just so inefficient. It really is. But it's really impressive how quickly you and your team have gathered a group of people to make something so inefficient, literally 24 times more effective. And so I'm curious, coming from a business background, how did you get past the idea of individual success to move more into collaborative or community success? And I don't mean this to say that business people are selfish. It just sounds like you were so hyper-focused on your organization's success and the success of a group of scientists coming together and working together to really amp up the efficiency of data collection rather than your individual success, which seems unique to me. Not unheard of, but unique. Yeah, well, social entrepreneurship, right? I think there's a lot of entrepreneurs that want to make business and do good at the same time because you find out that the doing good part is what makes you tick. It goes back to my mom. I learned that serving and giving was really where happiness comes from. It's not like from Mm. another zero on the end of the number in your checking account. That doesn't make you happy. You have to have enough to cover your head and feed your family and like that. But beyond a certain point, you know, the real happy people, you know, like they're givers, right? They're grateful for their lives. They give to others. They share. And so... It wasn't hard for me. Like, I love the entrepreneurial challenge of how can I build an enterprise to make it worth it for the Fortune 5000 to fund Mm -hmm. the science required to move the planet to abundance. That's an entrepreneurial challenge. Like, it's way easier to just make business than to try to make business and do good at the same time and then chase big impact. So, I mean, I think from a, there's a lot of social entrepreneurs who want to make business and do good now. For me, I had, done the other business. I had seen what that's like, and it was just a business. You know, Mm -hmm. it wasn't my life mission. It wasn't my passion. And I really wanted to try to turn my passion for the water into my profession. And you can see that it it, it evolved, right? You're always evolving. You got to chase change in the the world we live in today. It's change has so happening so fast. It's actually he or she who adapts first wins. You know, so a lot of people try to get in place. Oh, this is perfect. I just want to stay here in this. Well, you're never staying in one place in today's world. You're either moving forward or moving backward. There is no like, hold it right here. You know, it's just too dynamic. And so just kept evolving, kept always trying to be ocean first. I think that's the biggest thing that most people don't understand. There was no diabolical plan here to get in the shark space and suddenly become the world leader in the white shark space. We, we, we did Mm -hmm. not, that is not what we started out doing in 1997. We started working on the ocean. We listened to the ocean. We listened to the science around the ocean. We got older. We had children. We evolved Mm -hmm. in our thinking. And we always kept reaching to try to make the best and biggest impact we could in the ocean space. And that journey has led to here. It's fascinating to me that y'all's goal wasn't to just become the biggest name in the world of white sharks that you were and are so focused on this one principle of putting the ocean first and figuring out what the science says and how to improve the quality of life and the abundance of life within ocean systems. And that's just happened to lead you to sharks. That's not even exactly what you were looking for. I think that's just really amazing, and it's just a good life lesson for people to find a principle that they can stand behind and see how that can work into different fields of interest. And that's a good note about change, too. I mean, I don't like change as much as the next person, especially when I'm happy. But in a world that's constantly moving around and it's dynamic and it's never slowing down, if we aren't changing with it, then yeah, you're right, we're just falling behind. And I've also gotten to the point where, I mean, it's also part of my introvertedness that I put myself in situations that I'm uncomfortable within. I almost force change myself so that I can get used to change and now I see it as excitement. I mean, yes, I'm still scared shitless every time I see change coming my way, but there's also now a sense of excitement behind it because it's a new opportunity. Yeah, and I think a lot of people are afraid of change. 
Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know why we kind of come up with, but what really happens is when you embrace change and at first, maybe it's a little bit scary, right? And then you're rolling along and you go through some change and you stabilize a little bit and then you reach for more and go for more change. After you do that a number of times, it, it really is not scary. It becomes incredibly exciting. It's just, I think those first few times you go through it, it's, it's scary to people because everyone always gets in their mind frame where it's all or nothing. Like, it's either yeah. going to be fantastic or it's going to be a disaster. Yep, he's calling me out here. I am the king of spiraling out of control. Ron, ah! what, where are you? Ah, I'm in a glass case of emotion. Well, that never happens. It's always something in the middle and you learn something along the way and you, then you veer and, you know, yeah. you just evolve and, and reach. And if you have your, like, core values staying the same, like, no matter what decision we make and anything we do, if it's not ocean first, we're not going to do it. If it's not white shark first, we're not going to do it, mm -hmm. you know? And um, if you get confused and you don't know what to do and you test it against simple, basic things like that, it typically makes which direction to go very simple. That's a great way to look at it. Just break down the bigger picture. Simplify it down. Yeah. Yeah. And I would bet a lot of it's been trial and error to figure out what works for you and your company and to fit with your beliefs. Well, the enterprise model and paying for it has been really, I think, just as fascinating as like completely transforming the science side of things. Oh, definitely. I feel like that's going to be such an interesting puzzle to try to figure out how it all works and works together best. And then just to keep the ball rolling with that. And so another thing that I've been interested in is what does it mean for OSearch to have open sourced data? Like, what does that mean? So for what that means is what we share all of our tracking in real time. Okay, y'all, this tracker is one of the coolest things there is. So go to osearch.org slash tracker, and it'll show you where in the world all the hundreds of sharks and even dolphins, sea turtles, sea lions, and things like that that they've tagged are located and have recently been reported showing up near. So if you click on one of those dots, it'll show you where shark or one of those other animals has recently been. And so it's really awesome, especially for North Carolina, to see how many great whites are just off our coast. It's really cool. And I know that's scary to a lot of people, but don't worry. They're well off our coast. They're in the middle of the ocean, not right on the beach. So just join me in admiring them from afar. Mm -hmm. And then we also have all of our data up in this move bank database. And so when other scientists want to leverage any of our data, they send in a project description into our science committee, which meets every Monday, mm -hmm. and they review it. And then if it hasn't been done already by someone, then we'll create a special project and move bank for that particular scientist to get whatever data out of the main data set that they need. So they can maybe look at it a different way if they need it to get their PhD, that sort of thing. And then after the initial papers published from the principal investigators that were working on us while we were developing that data set, those sort of projects get much more frequent and we start pushing more and more data out. Is, mm. is the data truly open source where anyone in the world could come and look at it right now in real time? No. But if mm. you're someone who is a student or a, a scientist and you have a project and you, and you think our data can answer your questions... You're, you're, you're likely going to get the data unless one of our scientists is like doing the exact same project at that exact same time, which rarely ever happens. Man, that's going to be so helpful. So that's what we do. I think there's some concern if you just completely open sourced all of the all of the tracking in real time down to the actual like location. Because, you mm -hmm. know, when you look at the tracker, there's no lat launch. It's just a ping on a map. So if someone wanted to leverage that for some sort of situation that we weren't excited about, they don't really have the information to do that. And if you had all of that data out there, they might. Chris's mic cut out here briefly. So he was just saying that all that metadata, all that data behind the scenes, like the latitude and longitude. It just goes to the people who apply for projects. The tracking, you can just see it. There it is. It looks like it's off the coast of, you know, Charleston. Yeah, and my dad and I love that tracker. My dad found it a while ago, and he and I keep up with it every now and then. And especially being off the North Carolina coast, it's so fun for us to just go look and see what's out there. And even the big names of like great whites or tiger sharks, 
I mean, granted, they're pretty far off the coast, but it's really fun to see what's out there and how far they move. It's incredible the distances they go. But we love looking at that tracker. That's a really cool feature. The real trick is all the other science that's going on you don't see in the tracker. Hormone work, which is telling us where in that track they're mating, mm. right? And all the sperm morphology mark is telling us where in that track are they mating, right? Remember, the track just tells you where they are, not what they're doing where they are. So me being me, I rudely interrupted Chris while he was in the middle of talking. And of course, I do this when we're on limited microphone capabilities. Ugh, so stupid. So his end of this next part just got cut out. But he was just saying, so all the other science built around that tracking is what really allows you to tease the full life history puzzle out. And then, so what we have is we have each scientist that's publishing their own specific paper, which is usually pretty narrow and focused, you know, in their discipline of science. And then I have my chief scientists weaving all those different scientists and publications together to really tell the story of the shark's life. Right. You know, here's where they are and here's what they're doing. And they live that way up until they're this stage and then they transition to that. And on the, off the East Coast of the United States, I mean, we have, I think, 75% of this, 80% of the story now. You're going to see a big paper published here shortly. And I think we know that where the balance of the puzzle is. We just have to collect the data from there to prove it. If you're wanting to see all the papers that have been published related to OSEARCH and their scientific efforts, I'll put a link in the show notes. There's over 75 publications and it's incredible. From my perspective, I look at it as a list of potential interviewees. So I'm excited not only to read the papers, but also to look into the minds of those who wrote them. So join me. Within the next year or two, for the first time in history, the full life history of a population of white sharks will be documented, and that will be the Northwest Atlantic white shark off the east coast of the U.S. and Atlantic Canada. Now yeah. you know how to manage all your white sharks in that region back to abundance. Should mm -hmm. you need to, want to, or choose to, you have the data set to do it. And if you can move our white sharks toward abundance off the East Coast, the whole East Coast is going to be abundant. That's crazy cool. And that's so important. I mean, and what great timing, too, that like now that as we've had time for the seals to come back in the North Atlantic, the white sharks have been coming back. Now you've been able to perfect this method of collaboration to really effectively monitor and understand this species that's really coming back. And that's awesome. That's just great timing. And so now something that's kind of been picking at my mind since you introduced me to this idea of collaborative business, have any other companies or organizations or anything seen the success that you and Osearch have had with a collaborative model, both in business and science? and then been able to replicate that and use that for their own business or for their own science or for whatever they're doing. I think that some people, you know, we saw it early, right? So we were doing the TV show on ESPN, and then we did 30 hours of our shark work on the National Geographic channel and mm -hmm. 10 hours on the History channel. And we were using the TV. We would take half the money and pay for the ship to give it to the scientists and the other half to make the show. And then in 2012, we saw, you know what, everyone is like mobile first in the now. So we're going to bring OSEARCH into the now, mobile first, open source everything. I was seeing what Google, Instagram, and Facebook were doing, right? Create the product, give it away. Don't try mm -hmm. to sell the product. The old way was like create a product, know its features and benefits, try to sell it, make your profit margin, right? The new exactly. world of the Instagram, the Twitter, the Google is build the product, give it away. Create mm -hmm. radical scale around it and monetize the scale, not the product. Wow, I just never realized this. You know, it hurts to a certain degree when you find out you're the puppet and they're the puppet master. It hurts. When you go to Google, they give, they, it's free. You can search yeah. it. They give the product away, right? But uh -huh. so many people come and use it. They have so much scale that they're actually monetizing the scale, not the product. How interesting. And that's exactly what Instagram is too, or Twitter or Facebook, right? They give the platform away, create scale, then people want to come and speak to that scale, right? So that's how they mm -hmm. monetize it. So yeah. I was like, well, well you know, it's the, it is the era of content is king, brand integrated content, open sourcing, 
you know, mm-hmm. given away and create scale monetized scale. It's like, let's Google it. We've done TV. It's gotten us to a point. It's helped us build a brand around the world. But everyone's mobile first in the now, not watching TV at eight o'clock on Tuesday night. <laughs> yeah, I guess not. <laughs> We saw that in 12. And so we pivoted and went mobile first in the now. And I think we were one of the early adopters, right? Especially in like the research, the ocean research and advocacy nonprofit space, right? And so uh, because we were making the TV show we, got show, we understood how to make content and we understood social platforms. And so we pivoted in 12 and went to just open sourcing in the now across social platforms mm-hmm. uh, and open sourcing everything in the now because everyone's in the now now. And that's what's really shaped the O-Search of today, where, you know, we're live streaming from the ship when we bring a shark in or a video is being set real quick and pushed. We're tweeting live what's going on or posting on Instagram or Facebook what's going on. I think it was a big pit, big that we saw that early and we survived. And a lot of our companies that have been funding us over the years, they came with us from TV, right? And became our own small channel. And now we have our reach is many billions of impressions a year driving well over a hundred million dollars worth of earned media in digital scale because everyone covers our sharks. It's really amazing. Right. And it's become a value to the people who funded our work. I mean, our annual operating budget is $2 million a year and we drive over a hundred million dollars a year of earned media and digital scale. Oh my God. What? Then socially innovative companies can come in and be like, Hey man, let's help fund this ship. We'll be included in this project. This is, we are their cause. We have pedigree now. We've performed. We're not just showing up, right? We've been around. And they're funding us actually from their marketing budgets and speaking to their community about why they're trying to save the ocean while they make Costa sunglasses or Yeti cool. Mm-hmm. Um, and these companies also understand that if the ocean's full of fish, nobody's going to need to buy their product in the future. Mm-hmm. Like a $200 pair of sunglasses, you're not going to need if there's not a bunch of fish in the water or a cooler to go out. You know, so for years, I can tell you, Costa and Yeti been funding us for 20 years. Oh, no way. That's awesome. So they were the early adopter on like corporate sustainability, right? Socially innovative companies. Mm -hmm. And that's why their brands exploded and they're dominating, right? They were there first. And now everyone's kind of jumping on that bandwagon. But now we're a cause with track record and and we have radical scale. So we bring more value than a cause. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, you definitely do. And you've talked about O-Search evolving since like the 90s, since your show. How hard was it getting that first cycle of funding to to financially support your expeditions and your show too? And just what was that experience like? I thought I was going to lose my house and the ship three times, like lose it all. Oh my gosh, really? Oh, yeah. It was hard. Very, very hard. Hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Yeah. Oh. God, but, um, you know, now we're a little deeper in the journey and it's still challenging, but it's it's not like, uh, you know, when you feel like you're fighting for your survival. Fortunately, mm-hmm. we're past that. But now it's about maximizing impact. It's about mm-hmm. scaling it. Right. So you have a different challenge in front of you. Um, but, yeah, no, it's by far the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. No question about that. That's going to feel so rewarding, especially looking back at it now. But do you think you've changed any or have you stayed kind of the same throughout your journey creating O-Search? I do actually feel like in the last couple of years that I've actually changed. I think it was such an intense battle for so long to that I think it, you know, I was probably a little too intense. Yeah. Because I do, I do feel lighter. I do feel I am having fun again. Yeah. That's going to be such a great feeling to be able yeah, it's to nice. relax yeah. a little bit. And so is O-Search just a platform for other scientists to conduct their research or is O-Search the organization doing its own research? Our chief scientist, Dr. Bob Huter, is conducting a fair bit of science on his own, but then he's also coordinating all 34 other researchers. Oh, wow. We're facilitating research for, you know, SeaWorld, the Georgia Aquarium, WCS, New York Aquarium, Auburn, University of Florida, University of North Florida, University of South Carolina, University of South Carolina, Beaufort, <laughs> you know, you know the, the list goes on. Georgia Tech. Yeah, I mean, like you said earlier, what an impressive pedigree. We're an enabler that's conducting a, some of the science on our own, mainly because we have to have chief scientists on staff that keep all the other scientists organized and moving. And he's mm-hmm. doing work. 
Mm-hmm. But we're really facilitating, right? We're enabling other scientists from institutions with different disciplines to just leap forward, collect data sooner, publish sooner, and shorten that cycle so we can get moving toward abundance here. Mm, yeah, absolutely. So is OSEARCH just functioning in the Western Atlantic, or are there other organizations that do similar things in other areas around the world, or is OSEARCH even present in other areas around the world besides the Western Atlantic? We've already taken the ship around the world. Oh, We're just in the middle of the North Atlantic project right now. It's like a seven-year project, and we're getting down into the last year, and then we'll move the ship again here in another year or two to another part of the world and help them solve their white shark life history puzzle. So we've already been around the world, Uh Australia, Galapagos and Chile, Brazil, all of Central America, most of Latin America. Oh, man, I had no idea. So, yeah, no, it's a global thing. I think the thing when we move forward in the future is we're looking at more of building out a mosquito fleet. We've designed a smaller vessel that has a lift on it that can do the same work that's much less expensive to develop and much cheaper to operate a fleet of smaller boats around the world that's bringing the practical and academic together and including the world in that journey is what you'll see. I think, you know, we don't need another ship. I think it's too inefficient. It's not agile enough, Mm -hmm. right? It's one boat moving around at nine knots. Well, you know, it's great where it is, but you're not going to move it anytime quick. So I think you'll see us maintain that ship. It's a symbol and it'll stay in certain regions of the world, but We'll develop a mosquito fleet and then have O-Search stations around the world where we can not only support research of these larger apex predators, but the vessel will be, I think, something that the marine mammal rescue people and other people will be very interested in leveraging for their needs as well, hopefully. And that'll increase the efficiency of O-Search, which I don't even know if that's possible. It sounds like y'all are incredibly efficient as is. Yeah. And, you know, we're not, you know, we're not like shark people, right? I mean, we're ocean yeah. people. So we will continue to help the shark people, but we're mm-hmm. also going to help, you know, the other people need help too. Right. And that brings up something that I noticed when I was looking at the shark tracker was that it wasn't just great white sharks. It was also like tiger sharks and short fin makos and blue sharks. But then there were also like sea lions and sea turtles and even alligators. I think I saw an alligator or two, which to be honest, I mean, surprised me. Yeah, so we have oftentimes scientists who say, I love following your sharks. There's no way for the people who help me do my work to follow my sharks. Can I put my animals up on your tracker so people can see my work? And I say, sure, Helen, we do it for free. That's awesome. Just to help. So then maybe some uh, young person likes to follow a turtle and they're using our curriculum doing math on the turtle. Then they mm-hmm. find out it's a turtle researcher in the Mediterranean. And then maybe they're, they get turned on to that and they want to help those people. And we kind of help connect the dots, right? Wow. I never thought of it that way. But for the most stuff, when you see that it's the large white sharks that we're doing primarily at OSEARCH, we do have done in the past a lot of tigers, just been a number of years. But for the most part, that those other species of things, those are other organizations. We're just giving them exposure to their work so they can, you know, communicate with their community about it. Yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the most important things about science is that communication and that connection to people in your community through your work and showing the public your work. Because if the public doesn't know about what you're researching, then, I mean... What's the point? It's just a little bit more like me. It's like we finish each other's sandwiches. Sentences. I don't know what I'm saying. Sandwiches? That's how I was going to say sandwiches. Yeah, exactly. And I guess that kind of provides the reasoning behind why you added an education subsection to OSEARCH's agenda. Is that right? Yeah, what happened years ago, I don't know when that was, maybe 2013, 2012. Uh, I, I do a lot of speaking at schools, and I went to a second or third grade classroom in Jacksonville, Florida. Mm-hmm. And the teacher was leveraging the tracker to teach her kids math and geography because she couldn't get them to pay attention to anything else, but they would follow the sharks. And so she started having them build like full shark size cutouts. And then they'd have to build a ruler along it, all the inches and the feet. And then they were tracking them on the maps and they were learning how to use a map and geography And she was just like, yeah, you know, these STEM skills, it's tough to get the kids to focus, but they're focused on the shark. So I'm just kind of sliding the STEM in there. Like when she said, how's it work? And she said, well, it works amazing, man. I'm making progress. And I said, hey, are you okay if I bum this idea and try to scale it? 
because we need all the kids, right? Why not have education in the now, right? We got Absolutely. science in the now, education in the now, exploration in the now, everyone's in the now now. And so we went out with Landry's, who owns the Houston Aquarium, and they funded the, the beginnings of the development of a full K through eight STEM-based educational curriculum integrated into the real-time tracker. So like really? a shark could ping yesterday and then ping today and you could do a math problem on its movements. So it was like dynamic data sets. Oh my God, that's so cool. I was kind of a math nerd anyway, but with this, I would have been a freaking math geek, like super geek. So it just exploded and now it's, you know, it's in 250 languages in the English and, uh, and metric system worldwide. And it's, you know, it's so obvious though, right? Like kids learn math, you can either tell them, you know, if you got on the train in Boston and that took an hour and a half to go to Philly or whatever, you know, it's way cooler following a shark in real time with a real ping doing a math problem. Like, oh, this is why I need to understand how to do math. So it's in a good place right now. I think you'll see us you know, with the organization, things kind of pulse. You kind of get your this area of the company to where you want it at a good high level. And mm -hmm. then this this one, and then, oh, this one's lagged because you didn't give it any focus. Then you bring it up, right? And I think you'll see education kind of probably slide more forward and kind of taking it to another level, I, if I had to guess, in a couple more years because that's, you know, it's in a good place right now. But it mm -hmm. has tremendous potential to, to, to be even bigger and better. Oh, yeah, 100%. I mean, the opportunity there for it to grow is so incredible just because, I mean, I'm sure it was similar for you, but growing up when I was in school, it was for all the STEM subjects, I was just thinking like, what the hell am I even going to use this for? Like, what's the point of all this? It's not applicable. It's like, do a derivative here to understand what? Like, none of it made sense, but this is built on an applicable level, and it's amazing. It's amazing that you can use this real-time data to figure out real-world problems, stuff that it's actually used for. And then using real-time examples with sharks, that brings in the interest, and then the interest kind of takes over, and the math is, like you said, it's in the background, but it's working. It's developing. It all makes sense, then. And I wonder if that's like a major point that the schools need to shift over to. And so, yeah, has this curriculum been adopted on a school system level or is it more for the individual, maybe for like homeschoolers? It's there for teachers to just come and download and the full instructions and pre-tests and post-tests are all there. So it's just open sourced and free. Some uh, science teachers choose to use it when they get in their elective space, private mm -hmm. schools, lots of homeschoolers are using it worldwide you know when you're talking about the formalized curriculum you're getting into a whole deep like educational thing where they got they're teaching to tests right and so this is kind of outside the scope of that so it's always usually used as like some sort of elective science type of program hmm. yeah i do get that but have you noticed by any chance if i guess non-traditional schools have kind of adapted this curriculum this science real-time based data curriculum into more of a focus or a primary position rather than an elective in, I guess, like a public school. Yeah. When you get some of those real science-based schools mm -hmm. that are like, you know, charter schools or schools with a more narrow focus. Sure. Right. Yeah, all over. Like there's these green schools up in Canada. They, they're full speed into it. Oh, cool. When they use it, right. Then I will, um, oftentimes do a Skype with the school kids, you know, and ask oh, them questions so cool. and take them through why sharks are important and show them videos. And so they're getting that whole big picture while they're getting their STEM happening at the same time for them. So do you think when one of these charter schools or green schools uses the shark science-based data curriculum as the main focus of their STEM work, do you think that provides a good model for other schools to potentially adopt? I think all education needs to be brought into the modern era of dynamic data sets. Like if you're a kid and you're in uh, Atlanta, Georgia, and you love football, why aren't you learning math around all the real-time statistics from yesterday's football game mm. or basketball or whatever? If you love Michael Jordan, you know, and you, you know why when he was playing or pick, a, pick someone who's playing now, why aren't you learning your math, understanding 
the, to the real time data set that just came out of an NBA game last night, because like math might be totally frustrating and something that the kid doesn't want to do. But if all of a sudden it's like, Oh, Michael Jordan scored, you know, 42 points last night in the game mm-hmm. and there's 60 minutes in the game. How many points did Michael Jordan score per minute? Honestly, I think Chris is talking about me. That's how I got hooked on math is I was a big basketball nerd. I still am, but growing up, that's how I learned fractions, percentages, even angles and things like that. Because I was looking at the different stats, I was looking what a good percentage was to shoot in a basketball game. I was looking at free throw percentage and looking at fractions and how that converted to percentages. And when I was looking in how to shoot properly, I was looking at more technical and mathematically based shooting forms and then the perfect angle to bounce the ball off the backboard. You know, so for me, it was just applying it to something that I loved and still love. Basketball. I always will. My favorite sport, hands down. But you can see what Chris is saying by you take something that's interesting to that person and you can apply all these different STEM topics to it so that it's in the background and they're learning it and they're taking it in but they're taking it in in a way that will be retained because it's through something that they're attracted to that draws them in and they want to keep doing. Now all of a sudden kid might be fired up to figure it out, but if you try to give him another problem, he's like, what? He's, you know what I mean? I don't understand education. Like there's dynamic data sets all around us and all these kids have all these different interests. Why aren't they able to select a dynamic data set that's most interesting to them that plugs into a standardized curriculum to teach them the skills they need and make it yeah. fun. It's so obvious. It's first grade, SpongeBob. Patrick, I'm sorry I doubted you. It has to come with connectivity. Dynamic data sets are where it's at, right? Kid loves cars. He can do his math problems on the NASCAR race from yesterday. Yeah, you're right. It really just seems so obvious. Yeah, when we have more money to apply to it, you know, when we're not just, just making it by and we can invest, mm-hmm. it'll come. That day's coming. Just waiting on the day. Now, I've seen pictures of y'all processing a shark and just getting all the samples and stuff, but could you walk me through what a typical, I guess, routine or process is of catching the shark, of bringing it onto the lift, and then taking samples, and then releasing it? Could you walk me through what a typical sampling event looks like? Yeah, I mean, it's pretty simple. You know, you can see that on the O-Search YouTube channel. Uh, you know, we have a, uh, the the core crew on the ship, a crew of six, right? Three of those guys will go out first light every morning and they're going out and they're setting up gear. All is happening around the ship. You know, we got the ship plus two smaller boats. One's our contender. That's our game boat that goes out, actually captures the end one. The other one's a safe boat, which is our tender that moves people and equipment around. And those guys will go out and when a shark comes in and picks up a bait, right, they'll walk that shark back to the ship. The ship has a lift that goes over the side and it can pick up 70,000 pounds out of the ocean, right? So when that (laughs) lift is over the side, we'll swing the shark over that lift and Mm -hmm. we'll pick it up out of the water. And when we pick it up out of the water, we just come up just right above the water. And then the guys, me and the guys jump down on and put water in its mouth and and Mm -hmm. secure the animal. And once it's safe, we then invite the scientist down. We always bring the shark in on its side first, its belly up. Because okay. we immediately get a blood sample to test its stress levels and then ultrasound it to make sure it's a, like a late term pregnant female. We've never caught a pregnant white shark. Oh, really? Yeah. So we'll do about half the projects while it's on its back there. And then mm-hmm. we will have everyone step away. We'll, if it's a great big animal, we drop it back down into the water and roll it onto its belly and pick it up. If it's under 1500 pounds or so, you can just roll them with a few guys. We'll roll it onto its belly. And we usually roll it onto its belly after it's been on board maybe about eight or nine minutes. And then we'll do the last four or five minutes of work on it there. We mount the tags on it, get the final morphometrics, get the bacteria Mm -hmm. off its teeth and tongue and gums and its gills and eyes and things because we're doing a whole bunch of medical research. Uh, Well, the last thing we do is take another blood sample and then we let it go. And then that one we compare to the first one, right? So you can see the impact of things. So it's very smooth. You know, we've done it now around the world. I don't know, five, six, seven hundred times. We've tagged 70 white sharks in the Northwest Atlantic. Now the science team, their request was for a hundred. So, you know, we're going to get them there sometime in the next two years, I would think. And then they'll have the sample size that they need. And, you know, we'll proceed to a different part of the world to help them collect that data set to bring their sharks back too. So 
it's just about bringing people together on a common vision. That's just great grandchildren, ocean first. It's really, and if we get everybody on the same page, it's pretty obvious. And and in the past, the problem, there's all these individual agendas and individual objectives and, and that just creates inefficiency and a lack of progress. Right. It's just going back to what we were talking about earlier, where collaboration is key. Yeah, no, it's like the same thing your granddad's been telling, like teamwork. Been saying it for a thousand years. Yeah, teamwork makes the dream work. Also, I mean, like, look, we got no option. We can't lose this one. This is about like the planet we deliver to our kids. So there's no more yeah. time for that. Exactly. Yeah, it's about the future generation and leaving them a world that can provide them abundance. Yeah, just, yeah, it's right. It's not about us at all. But if we don't, someone's got to do it, though. And it's great to hear that your organization is focused around evolving and changing with the world around it to make it a more sustainable place and just to benefit everyone involved. Like, I mean, the morals stand true. What you're doing is for the good of everyone, and you're allowing everyone to work together to solve this problem that we've created. And something else that I've always wondered, what is it like jumping onto that platform with the great white shark on it? Is that scary at all? It's Captain Brett who handles that for me. And look, that is the thing that's so misunderstood. When you, when you, What happens is when you're trying to bring these white sharks into the cradle, they're not just going to swim in there, right? They, they want to swim around it. You know, they're just going to swim around it, right? Or try to go under it. And so all he's really doing there, Brett, is if you really watch it closely, he's got the line in its hand that goes to the shark with slack in it. And there's someone on the back of the boat holding. He's really just jumping into the platform across it. And there's a post in there and he's putting the line over the post and then he's getting behind the wall. So we change the direction we're pulling the shark and pulls it into the cradle. All he's doing is jumping across with the line and slapping it over a post. And then he gets behind the wall, kind of like a rodeo clown. (laughs) That's a good way to put it, actually. And so then what does happen when the shark starts to come up, he goes out and he'll grab it by the tail and center it and then roll it on its side. And then we'll pick it up out of the water. Right. So the reason we got to center it is we got so many scientists doing so many different projects that if the shark's up against the wall or something, we can't do them. So he, once it's kind of shallow and it comes out, he'll center the animal, put it on its side. Then we come all the way up and the scientists go about their business. So yeah, it's, it's, I think it looks fascinating to people, but Mm -hmm. he's really just, we've tried everything to figure out how to get that rope over that post. We've tried grappling hooks. We've tried gaps. We've tried. And the easiest way to do it is just for a dude to jump over there with a rope in his hand and put it over the post. It's good to have Captain Brett be there, right? Because Captain Brett, he's the most gifted waterman I've ever met. He's been with me for 20 years. He has Mm -hmm. a special gift. And so, uh, you know, when you're in the trusted hands of Captain Brett doing those sort of things. Yeah, sounds like you're pretty well taken care of. And I mean, after tagging hundreds of sharks, literally hundreds, and working as efficiently as y'all do, I mean... You've figured out the best ways to do it. You've got it down to a a literal science at this point. So I'm sure y'all are doing what works best and is easiest for y'all to work with. Now, how does OSEARCH influence policy? So we've influenced a lot of policy with just our data. You know, Mm -hmm. so for example, an example of this, when they make that, when they make MPAs, I think the largest MPA in the Pacific is the Rovia Hijedos Islands off of Mexico in the Pacific, which was put together in the last few years, you know, they were going to put like a three mile perimeter around all the islands for a park. And then our science team was like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Like, are you interested in the tiger sharks here? Cause they're like the balance keepers of this region. And they were like, yeah, sure. Why? Well, I'll look at our tracking. Our, our, our tiger sharks are going 23 miles offshore every night to forage. We'll shoot. So if the park's only three miles out, they're just going to get whacked every night when they go out. So what they do, they expand the park to 30. So that's the, a really kind of pragmatic way where our data is impacting various things because the tracking can help them yeah. understand boundaries and things like that. We're also on Capitol Hill quarterly meeting with senators and congressmen. And, you know, because we don't ask the government for money, right, because we're funded from individuals and funded by companies, 
we go into DC with a really different disposition, right? Because most mm-hmm. everyone else who walks in there is asking them to give them money or something, right? That's what yeah. these guys do all day long, every day. Mm-hmm. And we're coming in like, okay, here's what's going on in the Northwest Atlantic. You know, if you get somebody hitting you up on this issue, this is the real issue. Focus on this, the North Atlantic right whale. Somebody comes talking about that, your ears should perk up. Like that's serious situation we need to handle now. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, but then if someone, they might be some other subject that, that they'll ask me about or someone comes in on a like, man, you know, that's just that person has an emotional agenda because it thinks that animal is, you know, but the stocks of that animal are thriving. We've saved that animal. That animal's in good, good shape. But we need to be focusing our capacity and focus where we have real problems, right? So we've become kind of a trusted resource and they know we're centrist and data driven. Yeah, just very trustworthy. Yeah, we've become kind of a trusted centrist source for a few, a handful of members. And they come out on the ship and they observe and the local politicians come out. We're getting everybody in the project while it's occurring. So Mm -hmm. if the science says we need to do something later, they already understand why. Mm -hmm. Because they've been in it along the whole journey rather than just learning about it later. So... I would say, you know, we're constantly um, collaborating with other groups Mm -hmm. uh, that are pursuing data-driven centrist solutions, practical paths forward in the ocean. And quite frankly, we work very quietly in the background with the members to prevent legislation that is on an agenda that it may not look to be what it seems, you know, if it's not ocean first or shark first. And you're going to see that grow more and more in the future. You know, like as O-Search matures, I mature, our body of work matures. I think you're going to see us become a bigger and bigger player in the policy space. We've Mm -hmm. been really focused on the method and the data collection and getting them, including the world. And now our work is coming to the phase where it's, and I'm seeing incredible inefficiencies in the policy space. I see people Mm -hmm. in the policy, policy space that aren't centrists. They're position oriented, not solution oriented. We have Absolutely. a big voice in the ocean space and we're going to use it. And as you're, I think you will see in the future in OSEARCH Ocean Policy Institute at Jacksonville University, when we have the capacity to actually fund that. And then we will be an organization that has gone from pioneering the data around data sets that are fundamentally important to the future abundance of the planet including the world in that journey and accelerating that journey through collaboration and open sourcing, and then also driving home solution-oriented practical policy in the end. So every dollar that was spent on the water, every bruise my crew has gotten or, you know, slap in the face from a shark will have Mm -hmm. mattered. You know, it doesn't matter until you close it down with policy and we will make it all matter. I mean, there's been people mm-hmm. who've gone in our lives to this, bro. It's not fun. It's fun to be with the scientists and the fishermen and, and make the progress toward the goal, which you know will matter. That's fun. Mm-hmm. But I mean, you know, you would never think to yourself, hey, let's go out for a fun day on the water and try to catch a white shark. I've thought about it. It's not fun. They live in very cold places with lousy weather. <laughs> that's not where you'd be <laughs> oh and suddenly i don't want that <laughs> you know it is very rewarding and i'm grateful that that i'm out there but you know it's not like going bass fishing or bill fishing it's not like that yeah i would definitely believe there's a difference all that work must matter and so the, the that's why the, the again we were talking about evolving we were talking earlier about keep reaching I wasn't even in a position to think about an Osearch Ocean Policy Institute four, five, six years ago. Started mm-hmm. thinking about it maybe three years ago. It's like, mm-hmm. wow, a lot of our science is really getting ready to pop. Well, we need to make sure it's leveraged if it needs mm-hmm. to be. You know, and I'm only 51, you know, so I'm hoping to be here for another 40 or 50 years, you know. And so the policy component you'll see is just a natural evolution of how we're growing and evolving in our organization. And I think you'll see us become a bigger and bigger player in that space in the coming decade. Yeah, no, with how much y'all have been able to accomplish just in the past few years, I'm very much looking forward to what can be done in the next 10 years and what OSEARCH can influence and create. I think it has the potential to be really revolutionary. 
there's just as much dysfunction in the traditional NGO space that's trying to drive ocean policy right now that's got all sorts of agendas, politics ingested, and it's not just great-grandchildren first. And the money's not hitting the water. And they try to drive policy and advocate based on emotional dispositions, which never gets it through in the end because you have to have data because you're affecting economies. So it doesn't, it doesn't matter how you feel. What's the data say? You know, if exactly. you don't have the data, they can't, there's nothing they can do. So you got to get this data collection thing scaled up so that we have the data to demonstrate this way or that way. So everyone understands. And then you can find a position to, that's practical down the middle that works for all the stakeholders. That was the passionate and innovative founder of OSEARCH, Chris Fisher. You can find OSEARCH online at OSEARCH.org, where they have the Shark Tracker front and center Educational programs and updates on current projects are also found on that website, and you can follow OSEARCH on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube at OSEARCH to stay up to date on all things Great White Sharks. Chris can be found on Twitter and Instagram at Chris OSEARCH. You can support this podcast by becoming an official Elasmite donor at patreon.com slash elasmospod. And again, you have no idea how much it means to me that you give. It's incredible, and I'm so, so grateful. Please rate and review this podcast and send that rating and review to me at elasmospod at gmail.com to be entered into a drawing, and also share this podcast on social media to get two extra entries. Don't forget to tag us as well so that we know you shared. You can find us on Instagram and Twitter at elasmospod and on Facebook and YouTube at the Elasmos Podcast, a Sharks Universe. Don't forget to email your marine adventure stories to me at elasmospod at gmail.com so your story can be told on our next listener's episode. Our website is elasmospod.com where you can find links to everything and it was craftily created by Paul McNeely. The theme music was created and performed by Connor Blake and Wes McNeely. Wes can be found on Instagram at wes.mcneely1 and on YouTube at Wes McNeely. I can be found on Instagram at smcneely4335. And now that you've listened through the credits, here's my weekly update. I went on vacation last weekend. Oh, it was amazing. My girlfriend Catherine and I went to Seattle because we've never been there before. And we went hiking in Olympic National Park in a rainforest on a black sand beach and in three feet of snow on a mountaintop. It's such a cool place, and the scenery is just so different compared to anything on the East Coast. We had the best time hiking around and exploring the Pacific Northwest, and man, it was just good to get a break and relax. We both needed it bad. I'm also like 90% sure I saw a baby salmon in a creek, which got me way too excited. Might have freaked a couple people out, including Catherine. But 10 out of 10 recommend. It's absolutely gorgeous. Such a cool place. Okay, thanks for listening, everyone. Have a great week, and I'll see you soon back here on the Elasmos Podcast. Later, skaters. Mm-hmm.